She is a precious, precious, precious woman. Princess Black. She always, always, always say now. She tougher than a rock. Well, to start with there, um, my father he was a sound system operator yeah. back there in, like, in the in the, um, the, the, the fifties. He said it was called County Drops, you know, <clears throat> out of uh, Montego Bay. And um, in those days, I was like a little, you know, little youth, you know, what was really happening to my father. In those days, you have less, less electricity, you know, so you're thinking like dead calm, you know, and um, I mean, there's a little youth there, you know, a bigger brother. And it's tight. So um, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a run in the blood. You know, but um, during that time now, growing up like now in Mobile there, and then uh, from Mobile to a place called Clarence in Chapter where I was born. You know, uh, father leave from Mobile, come on the Chapter, and you know, where I was actually born. You know, but, um, being around like, you know, people like, um, um, Grand Rebellion and Arcus used to come and play in Chapter and Market House. So I used to see people like Dara, we used to see people like um, Oakton Lewis, uh, people like um, Alton Ellis passing through. In, in those days, like Arcus to play. You know, it's like a band, but it's much more like an Arcus with all kinds of instruments. And, and um, after leaving high school, you know, I came to Kingston in 1968. Um, um, we went to um, Western's Commercial Institute to do my. Uh, my uh, my, uh, my accounts. And um, after graduating from Western Commercial Institute in 1970, 1970, I, 70, 71, I started working at JBC 73. You know, so um, they know it's a strictly accounts. But you know, being like living in the inner city, no, you know, yeah, you grew up now to be like a, a, a young teenager. So it's all about fun in the inner city. So it's like, you know, present in the national. Sit like Perso Percy, you know, King Tobies, you know, Sir Dells, you know, you know, whoop and whoop and whoop and so. So, we just try the night and I'm merging them and, you know, watch and see what's happening. You know, those days you have people like Daddy you were a toast and, you know, and people like um, Prince Jasper. So, there's a lot of inspiration and then where I'm coming from with that musical blood, bloodline. But there was a guy called um, Freddy Thorpe that lived in Kingston 13, where I was living at the time. Um, Working at GBC there, but at nights now we used to go over to his home. We would just smoke pee ganja, you know, and you know, sip a beer and you nobody know, could say it. So, what was the night? man was going on, you know, to something and everybody said, Mary. So, one day, um, while I was there, the guy he was like a don for the community, Freddie, and he said, that, Man, you must try so we can record. But I said, Well, it's kind of difficult. So during time from 72, 73, 74, 75 coming up, I usually go to like uh, Joe Gibbs around the corner here. I just couldn't get on to the recording list because every Saturday after finish working a 9 to 5 from Monday to Friday, I would take Saturday out and go around Joe Gibbs and I would say people like uh, Dennis Brown, Culture, you know, Ronnie Thomas, you know, all these great passing shows. You know, the little youth, I'm a teenager, and I said, well, well, I said, Joe Gibbs, when you going to record me, sir. So I'll soon record the man. You know? <laughs> you know? So a couple of years passed by. But on a serious note, one day I was at um at um at um GBC and it was like on my lunch break like every um twelve o'clock to one o'clock, there was a guy by the name of um Milford Edwards, who usually was a technical operator there. So he usually play like the versions of um of the songs. So I was there singing all the version, you know? Yeah. He and uh, try everything and uh, tape it and spool. In those days, like spool or audio. And um, when he was singing, this lady by the name of Pam, Pam Ickley, um, she saw me. And she said that, you know, that time you sound good. I'm going to record you. And, um, you know, uh, I said, for sure. And I can retrack by saying that, um, um, by saying that, um, I love to know um, all the time. Okay, so I say, no. Mikey Dredd, he came there in 1975, you know, because I was um, passing from a board meeting one day and I saw uh, Mikey and he said that you have been coming to GBC for uh, 
technical operating job, but he couldn't really get through. So there was a guy by the name of um, Trevor Elliott, um, I was the Avi, now deceased. And in those days, when Avi usually, usually spar, you know, my sparring mate, you know. Yeah, yeah. He was like this, uh, the assistant technical operator. So I said to him, I said, well, yeah, yeah. Spurgeon, good yacht, you know, going to cast something and, you know, you need a job, you know, technical. So both parties are then and photocopy certificates and blah, blah, you know, boom, boom. The rest was history there. Mikey started working there. So, um, through Mikey was into the whole thing. Um, Pam said to Mikey, we must be as a um, co worker, and let's produce heavy, you know. So, both went to Channel One. In that time, you have um, Sly and the Revolutionaries. And um, we recorded a song entitled Miss Molly Card, which is my first song. And it goes like this. A lot of people don't really know that song. You know, people like in Jamaica, at the time it was very popular in certain parts of the States and, but in Europe it was, it was a massive hit. It's like um we small little could all you with some call you one day down to St. Anne's Bay. The girl he was a scientific call he I recall it and she was earned to say Hey Babylon don't you touch me call it back You know <laughs> Yeah and uh, that was my first recording produced by um, you know um, Pam McLean and co-produced by Michael Campbell. And um, then we did another song by the um, entitled Countryman, also produced by um, Pam Eklin too. And then uh, Mike, you know, produced um, songs like African Religion, me and um, songs like I'm the Gone. And at the time, you know, Mike wasn't really like DJ as yet. And then, but he was very hot on radio. I mean, he was one of the person who really revolutionized music in Jamaica. Reggae at the time, because in those days it was like R and B and certain music coming through. But there was like, like it was like an Irish yeah, yeah, like yeah. non-stop reggae music, yeah. you know. And uh, Mikey got that slot to um, from twelve on Friday night until five in the morning, Saturday morning. So it was, it was a, it was a trip. And then from there, I know, you know, um, I went to places you now with Mikey, like in nineteen eighties after doing like Malik the Gun and certain tune, you know. This light? Yeah. Yeah. You want to bright the light? Yeah, just kind of, you know, take off the oh. like spotlight. Like, you know, I don't know if it works. Yeah, we also, yeah. So during that time now, you know, me and Mikey, um, we know start to um, produce it. And um, we produce people like uh, Earl 16, you know, we just want Mikey up front. Because you now Mikey had a label called uh, the control label. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, you know, Mikey started producing artists like Mikey Israel, Earl 16, um, 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 Earl 16, yeah, for sure. Um, there was another guy. But quite a few artists like myself, you know, and both. He you know, also produced himself too. So, we went to, in 1980 now, she was so big, you know, for Mikey. And I would see myself in the picture here. I went to England, where um, Mikey met um, people like The Clash. So they asked Mikey to co-produce an album. So it was, a, it was a big thing at the time. So people like Mickey Gilligan, you know, Joe Strummer, you know, Paul, that's my good brother from the job, from The Clash, that's my good friend. You know, we, you know came here, Mikey co-produced an album for them. And um, then um, Mikey went back to England. And uh, we just do a stint, like open up for the clash in them. So um, how was that opening for the clash? Yes, I, me and Mike opened for the clash. How was, how was that? Oh, it was, um, well, as a young artist at the time, looking at like 100,000 people, yeah. he's kind of freaky out. Yeah. <laughs> she's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, uh, you just don't believe it that you know, you've seen so many people, yeah. like in the stadium. Yeah. You know, you'd get nervous. But as time goes by, within that time, it is settled And then about, about 81, me and Mikey, and we go back separate ways. We had to go back to England, really stay. And then I kind of settled in at JBC, my job as an accountant. Yeah. And I'm cool out for 81 there. How did you balance being an accountant and also being in the radio industry? Well, to be frank, to be frank, there are some people who come and some say. And if you are sent, then um, then things will balance yeah. as though you planned it. 
But if you come, then it's total confusion, and then you don't know how to really straighten out your thing. You know? But I think to myself, and I'm very privileged, that I think, I don't know, that I think was one of those who said, in my own form, and I take that with humility. Um, and there's a lot of people that ask me sometimes, oh, you're touring and you're working at JBC, but you know, in, in those days, you know, I can accumulate my leave. Yeah. You know, so if I say to my boss that I'm going on tour, and so much leave you have so well, four weeks or five weeks, okay, all up to you. Yeah. So you're going to get the people to come back yeah. because um, your leave is there. Sure. You know, so um, after that 81 day, you know, I want to stick a, a slap up there and, you know, fully uh, study, you know, to get my degree and, you know, in accounts and um, 82 now. Um, I met musical ambassador Trevor Elliott. You know, no respect to Trevor. You know, I think um, he's one of um, one of Jamaica's most um, prolific and um, um, arranger and um, writer too and, and producer. Uh, we came out with a, a, a single called um, Check for Your Wants. Yeah. Little girl, you know? Oh girl, I love you so. Oh, oh. Boom, that was the number one, straight after that. So that was like 25, 26,000 copies. You know, with number one on both radio station. What studio did you do that one at? Uh, we did a song at, um, at Channel One. All right. Right. And um, I said to Trevor, well, that's a single? No, man, let's do an album. And he said, okay, it's up to you. So I said, no problem. So we went back into the studio, no respect to um, uh, Ruth Radek's band, um, who had laid a track to Chit For You Once, and then we said, let's do the album, you know. And the album came out in 1982, I think it was August 1982, where it was a smash hit. You know, it went to number one on the album chart in Jamaica for seven weeks. Alligator re Records signed it, because you know they were in, um, I think we were in um, New York, Alligator Records, not, he's not defunct, right? Um, you have songs on that album like um, Look at the Penitentiary. I would like to see your face you made on a Wendy Day, a General Penitentiary. And you have songs like First Class, you see, know? Got to be a first class, eh? yeah, man. Work on Mr. Farmer. So it was an album that it was, and it's still a classic, you know, because right now that album is still selling by, you know, the hundreds. It's the um, this week by um, Ernie B, out of, um, I think it's New York. Uh, New York. Um, after that album went number one, we said, you know what, let's um, do some so During that time now, the album went number one, so we put out, um, I did a couple of singles now, like Handle and Blade, Smash It Again, that I've um, uh, written um, by um, Egg Tones, and we did a cover version of it, with number one, song like Isley Styley, yeah. yeah. song like He's Ride, yeah. so many hits. And then, 85 now, we decided to do another album entitled Coming Up Strong. So we did the big hit? Yes, yeah, yeah, Coming yeah. Up Strong. So yeah. I see, I was at my next one day and I said to myself, I want to write a song about my mom. Yeah. So, so, so your mother was an inspiration for Princess Love. Yeah. So I said, um, and there's something about five minutes to, to write. You know, because you just see your mom as a father and, and a mother at the time, during certain um, split within dad and mom relationship. So she was like the breadwinner, you know, take us through that journey of time, you know, my brother, you know. And uh, we did, um, on that album, So Okay, Trevor, I wrote a song that I think is going to be a smash hit. So why not now? Just like Check For Your Words, I said, no, bigger than Check For Your Words. So he said, oh, it's sound. And I said to him, say, um, she's a precious, precious, precious woman. Princess Black, she always, always, always say now, she tougher than a rock. The rest was history. You know, I mean, it tore Jamaica apart, tore the world apart. You know, Rolling Stone magazine in 1985, they wrote an article in the magazine that two songs out of Jamaica that give um, contribution and respect towards women out of Jamaica as, as reggae music. It's um, No Man to Cry and Princess Black. Who, who was the backing band on? Roots Radix? It was, um, no, Princess Black was, um, it was um, Sly and Robbie. Dean Fraser played Orange? Yeah, Dean Fraser and, and Nambo. Yeah. yeah. Dean Fraser, Nambo, and uh, Banana Man. But the Banana Man, no, he also played like I said, that guy. And um, 
But it was um, it was um, the whole was arranged by um, Sly and Robbie and um, and um, and um, and um, Robbie Lee. And then uh, on that album we have like you know watch they come look and see. We have like just sun come shine. Uh, uh, that was another classical album, do you know, do you know, um... Hey, for those who don't understand, could you speak about the, um, the payment situation in those days? What? Because in regards to the records, payment. Like, these oh. guys have, you see what I'm saying, how they have a different, your generation had a different versus Alton Ellis. Okay, well... Even though these guys were getting, are getting more than you got, mm -hmm. you got more than the Rocksteady crew. Right, 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 yeah. right. It's a fit. Um, what one supposed to realize that uh, music is a journey, music is a phase. Music is like 360 degrees. What goes around, because there's no, there's no music that is not written like Bob and Peter and Bonnie. And I would say, I would call them the Wailing Wailers. Out of Ska era into Rocksteady, into Reggae. That have a song by Bob, Peter, Bonnie, Kelso, Rathweet, all these greats, their tones. You know, Delroy Wilson, Alton Ellis. So it's a cycle. And if you notice today, the, the, it, it has not changed because what is playing now is sounds from the 60s. It's just into reggae version now. You understand me? Um, um, so we're talking about. So in those days, people from Ska era, it was a love to develop the music from, from watching. Because the first music that produced as uh, the sound was like quadril, which was more an African song, yeah. uh, like a Kumina song. Yeah, the like a mento. Yeah, like a mento, mento, quadril there. And um, the first album was produced by, um, in Jamaica, we like quadril. And that was the first album was produced by Mercedes Siaka, which is now was then the province of Jamaica, a leader of the opposition then. No? He was the first person produced that album, that was entitled Grassroot. Then you have, then you have Ska, and the first day, the, the first person that is Ska, because a little child was like into the music, I don't quite remember now. And then you have, then you have, then you have Rocksteady, which is the first person who sung. Rocksteady was Oakton Lewis, Persian Slap, you know, and um, from there on. But in those days, I get like a cow, I get like, Appreciate <laughs> it. It's not a joke, but in those days, for the love yeah. to build it, come into reggae. Now, when I kick off my own in 1978, you know, watching all these guys, you know, the William Willis and these guys, Delroy, who is my favorite, you know, because I think he's one of the best boys in reggae music. You know, uh, then the first time I perform on a stage, yeah, like in Jamaica here now. I was at the, the wall theater, which I get nothing. Only encore. And then, um, then um, my second show was in um, the Olden Theater. The Olden Theater. The Olden Theater, which, um, which, um, it was me, there were with some Keith Poppins. And she was loving there at the time. Like, like, even before loving there really briefly, all I got was um, because the producer at the time said that the show was uh, flopped. But in the theater, you know, the older theater manager, the after the theater was um, full up. So we said the show was um, flopped. So the big guy said, so, No, I said, Well, there are any man who rushed to promote and sell some money. What time? After the theater, nice and too many. Anyway, the guy decided to pay up. So my first payment. That I got was um, a bottle of Pepsi, a cheese sandwich, and twenty dollars. <laughs> yeah, for real. Yeah. But it was um, to me, to me it was a journey because I I I, I even love um, you know meals and even accounts. As I said before, it was it, it's inside my jeans, and what's inside the jeans it kind of really comes out, and what's inside your jeans it kind of come out, and from there on now. Um, I pick it up and shoot, we go by, you know, like Sun Splash. I'm during the 80s there now. Um, How was it working the real reggae Sun Splash? Oh, my first time on reggae Sun Splash was 19... Uh, uh, 
1985 race on the When the big gate was running. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the first time in Jamaica at um, Jared Park. It was Jared Park? Yes, Jared Park. It was um, to be on a regular sun splash in those days. It's a, it's a big thing. Yeah. It's, a, it's a wonderful thing. I got five encores. It was that time I built like cheap for the ones. You on the penitentiary, work on Mr. Farmer, Miss Malikali, hits after hits after hits after hits. Yeah, five and four. And then 86 Riggis on Splash again. 87 Riggis on Splash. 88 Riggis on Splash. Uh, Tony Johnson, Japanese Soul, he took me to um, call me and if I would have bought Riggis on Splash. 88 US store. And it's, that's, a, so that's a privilege. So we went and we did. Um, something like um, 68 shows within a six week tour. And um, I'm telling you, touring you have to be fit and be disciplined. Because if you're not disciplined and touring, then halfway in the tour, then you're gonna be sore. And when you're sore, you're gonna go through the door. <laughs> but I always be a, a, a very disciplined man. When I'm on tour, I don't really play with girls. When I'm on tour, I don't really drink. When I'm on tour, I'm the first one to my bed and the first one to wake. Sometimes I normally come out of the tour bus and just go in my hotel room, have a bath, you know, I sit there, watch the TV a little bit, you know, read my Bible, come back, you know, you know get on my blanket and I sleep. So when the bus driver comes like 6 o'clock and clocking, you know that. When they clocking at 6, it's 6 to rock, ready to go. If you don't ready, then you have to take the plane and take the taxi, they don't do I don't care about that. And Mr. Johnson was a very disciplined person. So I make sure sometimes if I'm extra tired, I mean extremely tired, I just have my rest in the, in the tour bus. And um, that tour was very, um, was very um, exciting. It was an experience to be in to so many places. From East Coast to West Coast, sometimes we fly, sometimes we drive. Cape was a place like Canada too. And um, from there around, you know, just music and uh, during the time now, uh, my third album, um, my third album, um, so I'm Eclipse, which produced by TPS, Larry Thompson, Jack Hotel, uh, which uh, we did songs like, um, you know, uh, Ghetto Vibes, um, cover version of um, Hotel California, which I heard us getting still a lot of rotation in the state because uh, the drummer, which is uh, my good friend, I met him in California in uh, 1991, yeah, around there. He told me that the best cover version for the telephone was one of the tough songs. And it's because I asked him why, because he came to the concert in, um, in LA and uh, he said that because the, the voice is different, you know, my voice comes crashing down. But I don't know what he meant by that. But he said that he really pleased him, you know, with the way of um, how the musician, the Sly and Robbie again, who really um, arranged, you know. And, uh, that album was a classical album too. And they had them like Ham Deep in Culture. Pollution, you know, so many songs that have song. Yeah. So sometimes I don't really keep a track, you know. Yes. How does he manage to keep a, a you see, I, have, I might keep that on those, but sometimes I'm you know, offhand to really have some that is that and that is that, you know. Because I have some of only 300 um, 45s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and um, so far, uh, about 9 to 10 albums released on the street, and um, about 5 or 7 albums on releases. How does he manage to keep a uh, a righteous message, a conscious message throughout your career and putting that at the forefront in regards to other family people. Oh. Well as I said before, some come, some sent. And if you um if you come there's diversion, then you're gonna last your real of the journey. Because you're gonna look around you for the glitter and the glamour. You now you sort of defocus. Because you have three people in the business, you have artists singers and entertainers. Well, I paid red as an artist because I like true artists, you know, like a person who like, um, you know, artistic drawing. But to me, I respect those people even more than actually the vocal because they, their work have a deeper message because they don't sidetrack. Some may be sex with tone, some may be, but if you look at the sex with tone, even the drawing, it is sending a message that we like sex. 
in the sense of physical sex. So, people like I consider myself as an artist. People like the Willie Wheelers are true artists. People like Dennis Emmanuel Brown. Even people like Joshua Bailey. And you have some young artists who come down, people like, you know, King Aiko. Uh, people like uh, Jaja Ramos, Kiki I. I mean, young artists who oh, are listening to what I play and my program. Because if it's something diverting, then I just don't. And then you have people like um, singers who just sing. They, they, they just sing, it doesn't matter what comes from Russia. Then you have entertainers now who's a different kettle of fish. They create all kinds of things. Sometimes negative in the media, sometimes confusion. But I see love and money. Because they all do play a part. And in anything in the world, you have the negative and the positive. Because without the, um, the positive, there could be the negative. The negative could be. It's like gravity force. Where I am to really like point my finger and really. As what Bob said, you know, you have to really fight in flesh and blood, but there's weakness in high and low places. Because I just love people. That's my journey. Because if I can love people, I do all my life. So what do you think about this thing, the music right now, regards to... Oh, the music right now, um, it's, it's good. The music is good right now, you know. It is good, but it's what I've been um, air on air. Because there's a lot of young artists who are singing good songs. Just like in my time, I was going as a young artist. But we're singing good songs. And young artists, they are singing good music. But sometimes, you know, within the music and people are involved in the music. Uh, you as a journalist, you know the whole snare. Which something I don't like to um, to um, to put my finger, so to speak, in the ink. It's for people like you and myself to speculate, because um, sometimes the worst thing is sometimes when you are, uh, if you become uh, in an individualistic base, I rather to like generalize. So I guess you know and I know. Right? And um, there's an article that came out that they were going to try to map it up, to wipe it up. But I guess if the, um, if the apple is rotten, are getting rotten amongst like six good apples, then uh, those apples, which is um, which going to also get spoiled too. So to change the whole thing and to have some fresh apples, right? You have to um, throw away those apples and get some fresh apples. But do we have the courage to do that? I know exactly what I'm talking about. But all I have to say to people out there, um, just do your thing. Because I've been singing for 31 years. And I've been through um, two or three generations in my music. And you walk in the street sometimes, it's amazing to sometimes, little kids are like four or five. Mommy, that's it, it's wrong. Sometimes I said to myself, oh, I don't know that. It's kind of, you know, you know I'm saying, it might not shoot like a tat. But it goes back again to say that if some scent, some come, because some people look at the, uh, the, the physical world, but the spiritual world is much more stronger. Because if, if it was the physical world, then gravity force within the universe, there, was not, there would be nothing up there. I don't know, there's a bottom or top or what. If it was for the spiritual, there would be no music, there would be no, no birds, no butterfly, no nothing. Not even hate. Because your spiritual vibes come hate too. Depends what a guy do you. And if you can forgive him, it's through the spiritual vibes. If it was only physical, then they kill him. And the world go blind, and everybody was dead. In regards to to make a transition from your early days to present day, um, well, I'm, I'm just going to amalgamate everything in one. My day as a child growing up, it was different. Artists respect artists. You as a fan respect as artists. You don't criticize. Even if you Del Roy and don't like what you sing, I still love your music. You know? But I don't like Del Roy. You know, just figuratively speaking. We love the artists, love the music. 
you know, right around the music because that's the only thing at the time within the inner city, um, in the rural, you could just listen to a radio. Ah, uh, yeah, you know? Yeah, you have some wicked in this world that bounce through. And the night time you have the radio at the bedside. Uh, but you know, so at 12 o'clock, we're going to sign off. What else what, what to do? I'm going to sleep. <laughs> but I guess it molded us as um, youths to um, learn to appreciate love and to respect good things and bad things. The artists of our time and before, uh, before my time, if you notice, they are more loving, more caring, more sharing, more together. You don't like the course of us, you know, they're more likely to you know, to each other and respect the family values. Now in, in, now, in this time, it's a different scenario. It's much more like a materialistic, it's more like the bands, Bima, Girls, the hype. And I would say it's much more like a spectacle. From the cable thing, you know, it, Jamaica. The BET, the, uh, the rap. You know, because if you're a young artist, you know, want to be like a, an R&B artist, not just like an American artist. No, I never tried to do that. Even now today, I'm still my old fashioned way. Because this is our roots. You know, a shirt, a jeans. Uh, turn the wool pants, pair of shoes. You know, we're not really, really tight pants. Huh? <laughs> 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 uh, tight up shirt, no. And we respect people, respect our fans. And uh, pure artists who are really doing, doing it culturally, they are also in the vein, but sometimes if they don't real, if they don't, if they don't be careful what they are doing, they will get sidetracked. Um, sorry about that again. So it's all about um, what I still love them. You know, because you know, you know, sometimes people get sidetracked by you know by, by what you have seen and by what you're gravitated to. You know what time like Rasta, Weed, um, Princess Black, you know, um, education, farming, you know. Now today you now I know you can't tell you to farm right now, the artist, no, well. And in those days when I was saying to my boss see me, you know, yeah. And I see it right now. He gave a notice, I told I was coming from the country, yeah. I was going to the taxi and wait till the boss come across and, you know, to go to the taxi from um, Spanish town, book, one stop, half which you would book across the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and people said, if it's right. What happened, man? What happened, man? I'm just vehicle. So, well, you know, sometimes it's best to still be among the people. Because you have to practice what to preach. Sure. Yeah, I don't have to really walk if I don't have to. I mean, but, I remember it's in the US. I don't know what I'm going to do. Anyway, you know, say there's a comedy. But, um, you're going to be saying something or preaching something. But, but it's like you get a question and say, Joe Rastafari, Selassie, yeah, I love to the common people. But when the common people come and say, Help me, well, to really touch you or to really get to talk to you, someone will say, Okay, I'm really snow with the man right now, you know. He will come back tomorrow. What's your name? I said, Well, we know, come and check the man. We uh, said, The man can't talk to you. As long as you're out of spirit and clean, man. Even if it's a devil, we will talk to you. It doesn't matter to me who you are. I'm just a humble man in my full fashion way. Well, I know, you know, 21st century. Which I think is still good. It's just a people. Because um, I think to myself, if, um, if, the, if the negative and the positive should really behave like how mankind behave, then all is destroyed. But I think the negative and the positive, they have a love relationship. <laughs> That's what keeps us going. Because when them buzz and fight and, you know, they make up bad but Just for the sake of us. Because if they, if they do end it like how we do it in the street, I don't like you, so let's go for your gun and kill me. And so the negative and the positive, I say, you know what, let's just do it, see me now, done, there's nobody here. 
Africa. So we're going to say, look, deeper than that. And um, materialistic is a thing that it, it, it is a destroy. You destroy, you destroy. If you're going to destroy the physical, it will be that bad because you could, um, you could turn it around. But when you get to the spiritual side, that's a danger. And there's a lot of artists today, not only like um, in Jamaica, you know, but all over the world. They destroy by these material things. In the world, it is to let someone see you to know if you have a Benz. That's a virgin name. And like I tell the king, if you don't have a Benz, you're a Bima. Enough time people smell up on the street and I say, what am I going to fix them? Laugh. Believe me. But I know exactly what's going through their mind. Because they caught up into a world of dream and fantasy and illusion. So if they cannot get it, they kill for it. Envy, jealousy, and hate. So if you get in the head, just people in general speaking. Yeah, yeah. Your next door neighbor. Yeah. If you have a house and a female is a little condo, we have put on two bedrooms you know, because you step up in a life. You mean with the cash part? Put on two bedrooms and I go upstairs. You don't talk to you again enough. Mm. Well, Mr. Brown. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but in your head, poor Mr. Brown, every know that you want him anything from an answer one. Well, so, well, we can't buy my toes and black. And if you have the money, he's a good man. He'll say, yeah, man, I mean. Because you want Mr. Brown to step up in life, too. I mean, you have to go and get someone now to start your thing. Because if everyone should have in the world, Yes, they will see the greed, but they should have this crime. And I guess the laws of men that they, um, they create, I guess it will be less harsh measures, you know? Because um, poverty breeds crime. And poverty, even if you're born in poverty, and and Jah help you to come out of poverty. But if you don't cleanse your mind and yield that wound of poverty where you're coming from, to look towards and say, I'm going to help somebody to heal that wound of poverty. And that person can tell someone to heal that wound. But if you sit in bed there and say, Oh, I don't give a guy my thing, you know, I don't want to get my own, you know. It doesn't mean I give a guy your wealth, you know. Him circumstances, start something. Like, when I saw sometime, I got a concert and said, I beg you too special, yeah, I give him. But it's not for dating. If I give you that, you go and say, We can fin pan that. So, you can't come back tomorrow and say, I beg you two more free one. No. Yeah. They never come. Somebody else waiting, that's all. Huh? Yeah, it's before if I can't love people over my life, I'm serious about that. For real. If you want material things, I could have get that enough time. I will not see a show of music amongst my virgin there, man. I could have worked like, you know, you know already. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you could go out and come back to Still not after taking a seat. You can't burst by, you can't spin. Clap up, really get big, it all. But I just want to be in the street. It doesn't mean that if he's a bright man or what Babylon place there, that's you can survive in their system. After a while, if you just go back to, uh, go back to like, where the nature is from. And let's not forget the first mission was with King David. Because it was there first, isn't it? Which man can't put Saul to sleep? Because Saul was a dangerous guy. Even him own by the guys was afraid of Saul. And my body guard him and him afraid of this man. Hmm? So, in life, you have to just, um, You have to just be yourself because people more people are up on the negative, but it's like the majority. It's like a man kill a man in a community now. The whole community get scared. But it's two or three men. Huh? True. It's like the whole community. So you must always remember that it's always good over evil. And evil can never conquer good. It only rain for a time. But after a while, good. Destroy that. Mm -hmm. And nothing lasts. And as long as you know that 
what you believe into and have a good heart. Because it just makes it to me so if it's true, I love you, you know. But deep in your soul, you don't love me. You poison your body. You take five years off your lifespan. And I tell people that, and I'm laughing, so already. So you check it. Look at people, weird people. Look at them, look. True. They are 20, then they are 30. No, I'm 54. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am 54. When I tell people that they don't believe, they say, I was like 39 years. I said, no, I'm not going to be able to say, no, long time. <laughs> because I never practice, um, you know. And I always listen to good music. Because that cleanses you. There's a lot of people that only task it, like the physical toxin in your body, if you listen to good music. And you, you, when you finish things like a bob or a garnet or you feel like you want to go to the bathroom to defecate, don't you? Because your body gets relaxed. So your organs now functioning properly. So you think, just like yoga, hmm? yeah. your body relaxes. But if you are so active and so bent up and you start to um, you cannot pass the yoga, you cannot go to the bathroom, you know, they call that your arm, they call it um, your Clag up or you cannot, you know, you bind up or, you know, yes. clag up. Mm -hmm. It's a free world. And as Bob Marley says, this music alone shall free the people. It doesn't matter if it's reggae or rock steady or scam. Mm -hmm. And this music, you know, shall free the people. Mm -hmm. And I love every artist, 17, every singer, but it's just you, because you plan can't carry it, basically. So you have to listen to that. Mm -hmm. And I must say, I respect my version, my kids, right? No. It's just life. And someday then I go deep into things, and I'm very happy to know I can give mention of Mikey because he's my friend. And he's one of those people who revolutionized music and read in this country. And for, it always makes sense I go in depth, because the people already know. Because he, he had already flowed the thing. So the people read about him, know about him, listen to his songs, and so on. Um, it would be a um, uh, no nonsense of me to really go with that again. But I love him very much, and the people read a lot about Mike again. I know this inside somewhere, you know, relaxing. As Bob said, my work is over, I will fly away home. So while lay on her, just do things, it's great. And then, um, before I wrap up here, um, even before last, I put on a album called Be A Lion, which was produced by um, with a, um, with a Reed. Um, did pretty well, you know. And uh, my last album is uh, Old Vibes, which is now doing pretty well, like in the USA and I'm um, also in Europe. And, um, 